Probably one of the most contested institutions in U.S. politics is the Electoral College. According to Pew Research, over 60% of Americans want to see the Electoral College replaced, and that's not just a recent phenomenon. It's been this way since at least the start of the millennia. Looking at history, it seems that this has been a controversial system for a long while, and frankly it has changed a lot from what many of the founders had initially intended. Still, however, around a third of Americans want to keep the system as it is for one reason or another. There is a clear party slant to the issue, with some 75% of Democrats supporting a replacement of the Electoral College with a direct popular vote, but only some 45% of Republicans supporting this change, and seemingly the more engaged in politics someone tends to be, the more likely they are to fall on the side of firm support or opposition. So clearly there's a very partisan element where either side not only supports or opposes the system, but likely believes they stand to gain politically from it. Democrats will often point to instances in which a Democratic candidate has won the popular vote, say 2000 and 2016, but lost the electoral vote and thus the presidency, while Republicans will generally appeal to tradition or argue the matter of state representation. Regardless of which side you fall on, it would probably benefit us all to look into the history of this system, weigh its faults and merits, and consider some options for what might be done to fix the electoral system in the United States so that those who believe in preserving it can maintain it, but those who raise fair arguments about individual representation can also have their needs properly served. Hello audience, Mr. Z here with another video for you. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We have videos just like this every week, and believe it or not, only about 25% of you watching are actually subscribed to the channel right now. So if you enjoy this type of content, I hope you'll hit that subscribe button and stick around. And if you are subscribed, fellas, only like 15% of you have your notifications on. YouTube's subscription system is seriously confusing sometimes, but basically, if you really want to be subscribed to the channel, you need to click that bell icon and activate those notifications. Now, back to our regularly scheduled program. First, let's just get a quick summary of what the Electoral College is for anyone unfamiliar or who might just only know a bit about it. When the fellows behind the US Constitution were debating how a president would be elected, they came up with a bunch of different ideas that didn't quite float. Remember, as we've stated in lots of videos before, even when the country was founded, it wasn't one nation or people. There was already a very evident divide on major issues between the northern and southern states on aspects of economics, government, and lifestyle, foremost among them the matter of slavery and scope of government, and a lot of this stems from the distinct origins and cultural genesis each population in the U.S. experienced. This in mind, the Constitution and the way presidents were elected needed to appease all parties if it was to be ratified, and it wasn't just about North and South, but also large states and small states. States like Massachusetts, Virginia, and South Carolina, the three major foundational states, all had large populations, and naturally states with smaller populations like Rhode Island, Delaware, and Georgia were concerned that they may be left with no representation or political power in the country, including in the election of an executive. How was a state with a population of 50,000 ever supposed to matter politically when its neighbors had populations four times its size? So a compromise was struck, and every state regardless of their population would receive three electoral votes in executive elections, one for their representative in the House of Representatives, and two for their senators. And the number of electoral votes a state got would increase based on its population and number of congressmen. Electors would then come together and cast their votes on behalf of the citizens of their state, ultimately selecting a president in a fashion which guaranteed even small states would receive a vote. Despite what some in favor of conserving the Electoral College might argue, the system has in fact changed significantly from when it was first conceptualized and even implemented. While today we go into voting booths, pick the presidential candidate we want to win, and based on which party gets the most votes, a slate of electors will generally vote for the party candidate on our behalf. But everything from how electors were selected to how the average citizen voted to the amount of freedom an elector had to cast their vote has changed. The electoral model, largely shaped by Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, who both ironically initially preferred a popular vote, envisioned a system in which various regional districts of a state would vote not for a presidential candidate, but for who their elector would be, assumedly someone intelligent and of good reputation in the community who would be fit to represent that community. That elector chosen by the people would then cast their vote totally independently of any party influence, judging for themselves which presidential candidate would be best for their district, while also deliberating with the other electors over which candidate would be best for the country at large before votes were cast. This model, though much less direct than the system we're used to today, did have a lot of good thought behind it, envisioning a far less partisan society than what would eventually emerge. 
a system which so direly wanted to avoid partisanship over presidential elections that the presidential candidates wouldn't even be on the ballot. It was said by the delegates debating on the issue, even those who preferred a popular vote, that this particular electoral college model was remarkably secure from corruption and factionalism while providing the balance that the country was aiming for, state representation and individual representation on equal footing. Individual electors would be chosen by popular vote in each district, and a president chosen by the vote of those electors, with every state's distinct districts being represented. However, by the early 1800s, there was already concerns that the system wasn't being properly observed, as the emergence of the party system led to electors becoming associated with political parties and candidates, and not deliberating or casting judgment at all, but simply pledging their vote for this candidate or that candidate. In this day and age, we just expect this of electors, and though we no longer directly vote for electors in most parts of the country, and even then typically by delegate vote, not popular vote, we still feel outrage when we face so-called faithless electors who do what was initially expected of an elector to cast their own judgment on behalf of their district, rather than just vote in line with the party. Because we have such a high degree of partisanship to the point that this act for an elector to cast his own judgment as intended by the founders is even considered illegal in a majority of states. It's believed Virginia was the first state to abandon the independent elector model in favor of a general slate or ticket of electors who had pledged to only vote for one party or candidate. This was supposedly as early as the election of 1800 when you truly had rival parties competing for supremacy, and this was certainly something Jeffersonians didn't shy away from as it went hand in hand with their populist strategy. This was something very difficult to regulate because of course election rules are generally left to the state governments and gradually state by state you saw the abandonment of the original electoral college system for what some called the subverted model. There was even an effort by Hamilton and Madison to draft an amendment to solve this crisis, but Hamilton would die before anything could manifest, and Jefferson seeing the new model as advantageous stonewalled Madison's efforts among the Democratic Republicans, saying it was unrealistic to expect any new amendments to ever be added to the Constitution. This was around the time the 12th Amendment was adopted, mind you, but in all fairness it would be over half a century later before another amendment was adopted. Much like the emergence of the party system, this style of partisan electors became something of an arms race situation, in which the Federalist states, recognizing that the Jeffersonian states could now elect Democratic Republican electors across the board, adopted the model as well to maximize the number of Federalist electors they could field, and unfortunately the nuance and nonpartisanship of the original system gradually went extinct. Toward the end of the century, most states had abandoned the elector model entirely, or at least the model of voting for a slate of electors, replacing it with a secret ballot where it would appear that you would vote for either candidate directly, but in reality that vote would still be for a slate of electors pre-selected by the party to vote for your candidate. In essence, some of the most valuable aspects of the electoral college model were destroyed before they ever really had a chance, and since at least 1900 you've basically had a popular vote with extra steps. There's a popular myth among opponents of the electoral college system that the United States is the only democratic country in the world that still uses an electoral college system, and that we must get with the times and democratize by instituting a popular vote. This is very misleading at best, and at worst is just a lie. The misleading part is that while the American electoral college system is unique, it's far more democratic than several other electoral college systems in other supposedly democratic countries. Countries like India, Germany, and the UK all see their executives, whether presidents, prime ministers, or chancellors, elected not by a popular vote, but either appointed or elected by a third party in a fashion even less direct than the American model, where at least the candidate is essentially directly voted for by the people, unlike in the UK, Germany, or India, where much of the decision falls upon the winning political parties themselves. Now we touched on something earlier, representation. The position in opposition to the electoral college system today generally argues that the model is not fairly representative, that it is anti-democratic for denying a more basic system of one person, one vote. But the American system doesn't just provide representation to persons, but states as well. The United States is a massive country, one of the four largest in the world, and it's not a perfectly unified homogenous entity either. Arguably it's the most diverse country of its kind in the world. There are a vast array of people and lifestyles across this country and across the states with vastly contrasting interests and desires. The idea of having states represent cultural populations who can then cast a unified vote does make sense for a federal system and for any large representative country that actually cares about serving the interests of diverse populations with unique lifestyles. However, there is a major issue with this concept which I have spoken about at length in several videos previously. The way in which the states of the United States are organized is terribly unrepresentative of the populations which inhabit them. 
We look at a state like Illinois, for instance, and find across it three distinct cultural spheres rooted in different histories, levels of development, culture, economics, yet we group them together as one state which politically is dominated by the major urban center of Chicago, and through the Electoral College the votes of those more southerly populations get watered down and added to the mass of electoral votes decided upon by Chicago. Insofar as partisan politics, this goes both ways, as you also have a large area predominantly occupied by Native American populations between the states of Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico, a population roughly twice as large as the population of the state of Wyoming. Yet because of the way borders are drawn with these extremely arbitrary straight lines, the vote of this population is watered down significantly and receives no state-level representation. Much the same might be said for the African American population stretching across the states of Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia, who in contrast to their surrounding counties which dominate the states overwhelmingly vote for the Democratic Party, and who with perhaps the exception of Georgia, lose out on state level representation. With US borders drawn the way that they are at present, you cannot have fair representation at the state level, and as a consequence you do not end up with a fair electoral college. This is especially evident with how swing states work in our presidential elections, because we only have a handful of swing states we see presidential candidates adopt a strategy of adding one or two targeted policies aimed at appealing to voters specifically from these states, as well as investing heavily in activism and advertising just to narrowly get over the goal line. The reality is that most of these swing states are actually extremely divided states with rival populations pulling in opposite directions. It makes no sense to give all of the state's votes to one candidate or another when the candidate appeals only to a subsection of the population, a segment of the population whose interests do not represent the interests of the whole state. Part of the importance of the Electoral College was a recognition that the states were different and had unique interests because the populations which inhabited them because of their culture, lifestyle, economic conditions, what have you, had unique interests of their own. Over time those populations have grown, shrunk, migrated, and otherwise shifted, and their circumstances have evolved. Thus the borders of the states should have been adjusted with consideration for that, but they weren't. This is part of the reason I advocate for ideas like Utahism, because a simple readjustment of our state borders to have more representative states would resolve many issues of polarization and of lacking representation both on the local and federal level without needing to change much else. In this case, how it would affect the Electoral College, a redrawing of borders based on distinct lifestyles and cultures would essentially reincorporate the district model proposed by Hamilton and Madison, giving representation not just to arbitrary states, but to populations of Americans who have unique interests. Under the Utahist model for redrawn states I've discussed in previous videos, each population would automatically require at least a population of around 1 million to qualify for statehood, and state borders would be liable to be readjusted every decade or so based on population change, preventing Wyoming situations where states are vastly underpopulated and thus receive disproportionate representation. Rather than adjusting population requirements to qualify for a representative across the several states as is done now with extremely unequal variants, see Rhode Island who claims one representative every half million citizens, versus Delaware who receives one representative every 900,000 citizens. Plainly that's not fair, so instead the states themselves are held to a threshold, one million. This would further create incentives for states to want to grow their domestic populations or even attract citizens from neighboring states to assimilate into the local state culture and thus increase the representation, without compromising state identity as the state itself would be based on a local culture and lifestyle, meaning you can't just demand mass immigration to artificially grow your population as even if you could, the Utahist model would allow any contiguous population of 1 million or more people to petition for statehood, and if they have a genuinely divergent culture or interest from the rest of the state population, they can be granted this. Another great strength of the Utahist model in actually making the electoral college work is what it would do to swing states. We touched on this briefly, swing states can be the bane of many Americans just because of the aggressive campaigning candidates will go through to just narrowly win over three or four states while neglecting the rest. Instead of having Pennsylvania as one large and politically diverse state split narrowly between broad Republican and Democratic coalitions, you might instead see five states with a modest number of electoral votes each, with very specialized interests which demand more specific and dedicated policy promises, promises which can either achieve actual compromise between competing interests, or make clear a commitment to a certain policy. Under this model, federal elections, not just presidential elections, would be far more competitive and representative. With states built around distinct lifestyles and needs, I'm also inclined to believe that this would lead to the viability of more than just two political parties, with the diverse states able to place more unified support behind third and fourth party candidates who can more directly appeal to them and more easily secure their electoral votes. This redrawing of states has the potential to set the electoral college system right. 
It seemed like the founders had something in mind for the system when they set it up, but failed to secure it from exploitation, or rather, unforeseen developments like the party system and extreme partisanship, which also demanded change to how the president and vice president were selected. Though for some reason, no one thought to tack on Hamilton or Madison's fix to the Electoral College as well. It's understandable why so many people take issue with the Electoral College, it's definitely a bit broken. However, it must be plainly recognized that many of those who call for a reform of the Electoral College system today do so for little more than because they believe it would enrich their political faction. It certainly falls short of being optimally representative, but the argument that a popular vote would fix that is also naive because America is not like many of these smaller, more homogenous countries. It's a diverse land with very distinct and competing interests which deserve their own due representation. Criticism is also due for many of those in favor of the Electoral College who cling to this idea that it was the model the founders always wanted, when in reality it's nothing of the sort. The system the founders wanted got hijacked and it was never fixed. Things like the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact are interesting developments that I think more than anything highlight how much more our system has in common with a popular vote than other supposedly democratic countries. However, just looking at the map, it's very evident this is something clearly divided along partisan lines, with all the states committed to the compact being strongly supportive of the Democratic Party. What a country like the United States needs to aim for in its federal level elections is that balance between people and states. That's built into the foundation of how the US system works. That's the reason we have a bicameral legislature, where the population is proportionally represented in the House and the states are equally represented in the Senate. That's not about elitism as some people make it out to be, that's about giving due representation to the individual people and the states as a whole. The issue here is that again the boundaries of the states don't represent a distinct people or lifestyle anymore, and they need to be adjusted to be optimally representative. This goes for the majority of elections, you shouldn't be seeing such close elections between two starkly different candidates. When you see that enough times across the state's history, that's an indication that the state is deeply divided between different populations or interest groups and it might be time to split it, redraw it, or adjust it so that the respective populations can move in the directions they actually want to move in. We need state lines that actually reflect our lives, borders by the people and for the people. But those are just my thoughts. Let me know what you think in the comments below, like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more. Mr. Z, out.